Alfred Hitchcock. Good evening. If you would turn your Bibles to first, I'm sorry, Second Chronicles chapter 16. And as you make your way there, uh, my family's down in Mexico. Uh, Ethan, Anastasia, and Annabelle are down there visiting in Ensenada. So I appreciate your prayers. Keep them safe. You know, you always hear all those crazy stories of everything that happens down there. But, um, you know, the Lord called them down there. So appreciate your prayers for them. And uh, continue to check out the website, uh, ccwatsonville.com. or adding new messages uh, and the, some of the videos there. We also are at Calvary Chapel Watsonville on Facebook and Calvary Chapel Watsonville on YouTube. So the web page is ccwatsonville.com. And uh, um, we're trying to get everything uploaded there and get some of the new stuff for the Biker Church that's coming up um, this 4th of July. So pray for that. If you want to know more about it, just talk to Marty or you can go onto the web page under the Biker Church and his contact information's there. But coming up this 4th of July, they're going to be doing an outreach there in Hollister at the Scaled Down Biker Rally, right? Marty, I guess it's scaled down, but they'll be out there as a light, which you've been out there for how many years now? It's been a long time, huh? Yeah, so pray for that as well. So that's coming up in the not-too-distant future. Uh, not this weekend, but next weekend, right? So, all right. Well, hopefully you made your way to Second Chronicles chapter 16. And uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer, and we will pick it up. At verse 1 of Second Chronicles 16. Everything looks okay, Patrick? We're good to go. All right. Father, we just thank you now as we come before you and um, have our, your word open uh, to our hearts, Lord. We ask that you would speak and move uh, through our hearts and through our midst, Lord, and uh, in our lives, Lord, as you speak to us through your word, Lord. And you could crack open the sky. You could dispatch angels. You could... I don't know, make the trees talk. I, I could think of eight trillion different ways that you could communicate with us, Lord. And you do communicate with us in, in many ways, Lord. But I know one of the biggest ways, certainly in my life, is through your word. And uh, that's why you've preserved it. And that's why we look at it and study it and spend time in it. And so, Father, um, we know that's what you tell us to do. And uh, so I thank you now that we have it and we're able to look at it. And we ask that you would just bless this time. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we left off last time with uh, King Asa. Uh, uh, just came, you know, his dad, his grandfather, uh, not believers, didn't do well. Asa came to the throne, uh, had a heart for the Lord. Remember, the Lord gave him like 10 years of peace. And, and then all of a sudden, this million-man army from North Africa, you know, uh, comes up. And, uh, uh, you know, he, there's just, just no way with their, and, and along with all their chariots and horsemen and all that. And, and, you know, Asa just realizes there's just nothing we can do. Lord, we look to you. We depend on you. And the Lord gave them a great victory. And you remember when they were coming home back into Jerusalem, the Lord spent a prophet and said, listen, and reminded them, hey, listen, the Lord's with you. Uh, uh, as long as you're with him, you know, keep your heart, keep your mind, uh, keep your life focused on on me and drawing them close. And then that really spurred Asa on and all the leaders, but particularly Asa, to continue to do great things and and uh, you know uh, draw closer to the Lord. And the Lord just continued to uh, bless them. Uh, he was really on fire after seeing the Lord just deliver this great army into their hands. And um, well, we left off, you know, some time has passed now. That happened in his 10th year of his reign. And 1 Kings 15 gives a little different date. And I won't go into all that, but it's they just measured the beginning and the end of one thing just a little differently. But um, we've kind of, uh, years have passed. As a matter of fact, verse 1 said, in the 36th year of the reign of Asa. So 26 some odd years had passed since that great victory. 
And remember, the Lord's been blessing him, and uh, but but a lot of a good chunk of time has passed, and uh, you know he'd served the Lord in a great way for a number of years, but now in this thirty-sixth year of his reign, well, let's read it in verse one. Uh, Baasha, the king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to King Asa, uh, to Asa, king of Judah. So here's the situation, and I'll, and I'll, I'll put this map up. So remember that the, the nation's divided. You see Judah, you see Israel. There's, you know, they're, they're separated. It's been that way now for four kings in the south. Um, and he's come up and he's building Rama. You can see Rama is kind of that uh, green line goes to it. He's actually come into a, a little bit of the southern tribe of Judah. And he is built, it's called Ramalia today, by the way. Uh, that's pretty much the same site that sounds familiar to some of us, but it's called Ramalia today. But what he was doing was basically the king of Israel came down and started building this city, which would cut off the trade, this important trade route in and out of, of Jerusalem and in and out of the territory of Judah. And so the idea is whoever's controlling the trade coming in and out, you know, that's a big deal. They could cut off supplies. They cut out any kind of uh, ability to have the people that live there to trade their goods or their crops or their animals, whatever it is, you know, you've just cut off this huge uh, trading route. And so, so it's a big deal. The idea was he was building a place so that nobody, he could control the trade traffic coming in and out of King Asa's uh, realm, Judah, and more importantly, Jerusalem. And um, uh, it's a big problem. But is it bigger than a million man army with chariots and horses coming in to attack him when in his 10th year reign? Is it bigger than his grandmother we talked about last time worshiping something evil in his house? And he just said, you know what, I, you know, I, we're supposed to respect and that culture particularly respects the elders and, you know, uh, but this was wrong. It was at home. We talked about that last time. And he said, it, she, she, she just can't be in any kind of position worshiping that and having that heart. I'm going to get rid of that thing. And he burned it. And he pretty much pushed her aside to have any kind of influence in the nation. And is this bigger than, than those kind of two big events? Um, were, the, were Asa, you know, relied on the Lord as he knew he should have and, 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 and just was on fire and said, Lord, this is what would honor you. This is what you'd like. We trust you to defeat us against this insurmountable odds. And now some 25 years or so have passed, and uh, he, he, he's facing this another big difficulty. And it certainly was a big deal. As big as some of the other things, uh, arguably maybe not so much, but it's still a huge deal. And so what does he do now? Well, verse 2 says, Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord, and of the king's house, and sent it to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you silver and gold. Come, break your treaty with, treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he might withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad heeded king Asa, and he sent the captains of his army against the cities of Israel. They attacked Injon, Dan, Abel, uh, Ma'am, and the store cities of Naphtali. Now it happened when Baasha heard it that he stopped building uh, Ramah and ceased his work. Then King Asa took all Judah and carried away the stones and the til timber of Ramah, which Baasha had used for building, and with them he built Gibeah and Mizpah. So if you look at our, um, our, our map here now, so he's, he basically went up to Damascus. You see Damascus at the top here. He went to Ben-Hadad, right? He, he, he has this brilliant strategic move. He gets silver and gold that he had dedicated and people had given to the Lord. 
and takes that money and sends, you know, whatever amount he sends, um, and he sends it to uh, uh, Be um, Ben Hadad in Damascus there and says, hey, you know what? I know you have a treaty with, with the king of Israel, Baasha, but I want you to attack him up there. And so he'll stop building this city. His, his soldiers will have to go there. And, and that way we can dismantle this, this big city that's going to, uh, the fences that he's building up, that's really going to choke out the life of the country here. And so he, he, he does that. And you can see that little red line, if you can, on the map there from Damascus. And those are the cities up there that he, that he attacked. And, and that caused those city of Rama to be moved in Gibeah and Mizpah. You can see those two cities there to now all of a sudden take all that building material that Baasha king of Israel was using and fortify these other cities so he wouldn't have an opportunity to do this. And um, guess what? It worked perfectly, right? He was able to get all his people to go remove all the billing materials. He was able to, to stop this whole big problem that was going to happen here. And you can imagine at the end of all this, the people were probably very happy. The people loved Asa and they thought, wow, he's great. What a smart guy. He figured out what to do here to get rid of this big problem that we had with Baasha coming down and, and, and going to really choke the life out of the nation here. Um, and wow, 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 let's pat everybody on the back. Let's say hip, hip, hooray for the king, for he's a jolly good fellow and all that kind of good stuff. And, um, you know, what a great thing he did. But what really happened, what did he really do? Rather than rely on the Lord like he had in the past, you know, some some 25 years had passed since that last great reliance. And, and arguably 35 years he's been walking with the Lord and, and those years have gone by and gone by and gone by in the 10th year. Yep, there's this great walk of faith. And after the 10th year, some, some great years of revival and walking really strong with the Lord. But now you notice there wasn't one prayer offered up. What he does is he relies on mercenaries, his own resources, and not the Lord to get out of this problem, this great difficulty that had come into his life and the, and the life of his people. What Asa did is what everybody else does. You remember, just think, you know, put the Wayback Machine in your, in your mind when we were reading about David not too many weeks ago. And do you remember that, that there was many nations that would come against David and, and then they would they would lose. And so what they would do in to, to try to win back or to try to defeat him, they would hire mercenaries and they would get these mercenary armies. And these people got these mercenary armies and these people got these mercenary armies and, and, and to fight against David. And, and, and the Lord gave his, his great, great grandfather all this great victory because he trusted in the Lord. And even when he had these great victories over these huge mercenary armies, remember, and he would get all these chariots and all these chariot horses and all these other great battle uh, equipment that he would win in these victories, he, he just, he wouldn't keep it. He would just keep a really small little portion. And, and again, most of the horses that were super valuable and well-trained, you know, he, he would turn them into plow animals or animals that would just pull loads or would work on the farm. They couldn't work in battle anymore because he would, they would, you know, they called them hamstring them and they couldn't run. Uh, they were still good workhorses, um, and they would get rid of the chariots. They'd burn them. And he would keep a few, but he trusted in the Lord. And it wasn't in his war equipment or how good he could fight or how smart he could be in battle. Uh, again, uh, he didn't do that. But Asa, you know, seems to, though he had a great start and, and you know, still, uh, I believe, you know, love the Lord. But, you know, his spiritual health, his spiritual vitality, his spiritual connection and relationship with the Lord at this point seems to have waned quite a bit. Um, and he's kind of just doing what everybody else would do. Um, they, they, they're, you're hiring mercenaries to, to, to help. Um, now, certainly there's countries that kind of do that today, but, you know, for us, it's more like, you know, people today will use their influence or their wealth 
um, or, or some kind of knowledge or some kind of, you know, experience to, you know, identify these problems or get out of these situations or something difficult comes in. Or, oh man, I can hire this person. I can call this person. I can, I can ask this person to help out. I can do all this. And, you know, uh, you, you know, we can find ourselves doing that very similar today. And the scary part is we can be successful in it just like Asa is. And and again, um, uh, the the Lord gives us a very clear warning here. And the warning is, uh, you know, uh, he's going to address it in a minute here, uh, is that, you know, don't rely on yourself. Don't rely on your own abilities or your own wisdom or your own way of figuring things out. Remember, Asa doesn't find himself in idolatry or, you know, some terrible sin that's easily identified, like maybe David, his great-grandfather did, of caught in adultery and then murder. He's not worshiping at any kind of a place of idolatry like his dad or his grandfather, or even his, his great-grandfather Solomon at closer to the end of his life. You know, you don't, you don't find him there. You don't find a, a sin identified like a lot of people go, oh man, there you go. He got into sin. A lot of people say, well, he was just smart and he was successful and it worked. And, and, but that's the problem is he will rely on his own thinking, his own ingenuity, his own self-sufficiency. And the scary part is it's, it's successful and all looks great on the outside. But remember, the Lord is looking at our heart, and and He, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, is, people would look at this and say, "Oh, no, no big deal." As a matter of fact, smart, smart king. But the Lord's going to call Asa's uh, to Asa uh, his attention on this. Who are you really trusting in? And this is what He says in verse seven. At that time. Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubin not a huge army with many chariots and horsemen? So he's bringing it back. Remember that battle some 25 years ago? And it was just impossible. Uh, what did you do then? Did you start taking the gold and silver and try to buy some more soldiers so that you could have this victory? No, he said, yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. And, and then notice one of the great verses in the Bible. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly, therefore now you shall have wars. Um, what the Lord says to Asa here is, Asa, you, you know, uh, uh, I know, uh, you know, everybody, you know, thinks it looks good and it's successful and it doesn't look like any kind of an obvious sin to, to the people, but the reality is, Asa, when have I ever let you down? When wasn't I able to help you greatly in the past? Is there a case, Asa, when you couldn't count on me or I have left you down or failed you in some way? Remember what I have done in the past. You know, Asa kind of thinks that the ends justifies the means. That means as long as uh, uh, you know, it's, it turns out for good. It doesn't really matter how I get there as long as I, you know, uh, uh, it turns out for good. And, and that's just never true in the heart of our Father. He, he constantly and always is desiring for us to build our relationship and our trust and looking to Him. And what can happen in our lives uh, it, it, it can happen so easy that we, oh, we've had some experience. Oh, this problem's coming up. Well, this situation's here. Well, 
you know, I can figure it out. Or maybe, you know, I, I have a little more resources now than I did when I, you know, when I was a lot younger and I had to just pray about it. Now I have a little extra money in the bank. And so if some big problem comes up, maybe, you know, financially, I might be able, I take, be able to handle a little bit better, right? Or, or you know, you know, I know people now and, you know, even, you know, knowing and, and spending time and walking with the Lord, you know, as time goes by, you know, we can start relying on our own wisdom and our own way and become self-sufficient, our own ingenuity and, you know, our own experience and not trust and have that heart of trusting in the Lord. I was talking to Ethan the other night. He had just come home from a week at Camp uh, Hume Lake up there. And man, he came home on fire. And um, as a matter of fact, when I picked him up Saturday afternoon, evening, uh, he talked to, uh, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six of the guys. He said, hey, you know, they've been gone for a whole week, right? And they, you know, stay up all night. And let's just go over to Chick-fil-A and Salinas, because none of them had ever been at Chick-fil-A before. Let's go. Yeah, we take it. Oh, sure. I'll take you over to Chick-fil-A. So we go over to Chick-fil-A and we're, I'm sitting there listening to these, you know, high schoolers talk and, and, and all this good stuff. And we're talking about things in the car and all this. And it was just great. And then, you know, Sunday, uh, you know, we talked to him and he's been texting. He has a group text. He's just, you know, people came to know the Lord from the youth group and it was just a great thing. And then, um, you know, Father's Day. And then last night sitting down, I'm like, Dad, I just, you know, I'm having kind of a rough time. And uh, quite the opposite, right? From my perspective, he is great, but I already know what's happening, right? He, and I was telling this, you know, he was for a whole week and they had great worship, he said, and the, and the, the, the pastor that was doing all the teaching was just, he said he was hitting everything. It was just great teaching. I said, what well, Ethan is like, you were up on the mountaintop and then you, you, you came, <laughs> you came home and you're not having, you know, uh, worship three times a day and, and you're listening to two, two or three messages a day, and, you know, and, and talking about these things of the Lord. You're kind of going to swim practice now and you're having to clean your room and you're helping me take out the track. You know, you're kind of, you're, you're back here. And I said, well, one of the things is, is just, you know, you like to be able to stay up here, but most of the Christian life is not on the mountaintop, nor is it in the valley. It's, it's somewhere in the middle. And I said, um, you, you know, it, it's, we have to remember that sometimes the valleys seem like they last forever and the mountaintops are way too short. But I said, you know, we live here and, and I said, and, and it just takes time and effort. And, you know, it seems like everything is dropped off, but no, it hasn't. It just changed a little bit. And, and then we were started talking and I started saying, you know, it's been a, over 40 years. I've seen enough. And I was thinking to myself, wow, I walk with the Lord over 40 years. That seems like an attorney all of a sudden. I don't feel like I'm that old, but I know I am. Patrick reminds me, certainly Marty, we can say that when we hunch back around. But still, you know, we were just talking about age today. But anyway, I, you know, uh, you know, I started thinking about that. And, you know, it's kind of in the same place that Asa was. And you can find yourself thinking, well, you know, this person has this or that. That Okay, that comes up. I, You know, I, I'm just in Psalms in my, uh, you know, devotional reading. And, and uh, you know, a couple, a couple of days ago, I was reading Psalm 139. And I always think, you know, whenever I visit somebody in the hospital, that's one of the typical Psalms that I always read. Um, and um, and I was thinking about that. And, and you know, I, I, I and then I was studying for this and thinking about this, I, you know, I just need to be careful. We all need to be careful. We can all find ourselves, and, and it doesn't have to happen after 35 years. It can happen after five years. It can happen after five months or 15 years. And, you know, we can find ourselves kind of just think we got things figured out. It doesn't mean we're not going to church and we don't love the Lord, but, you know, um, what's our dependency like, especially when we get a little older and maybe we have a little bit more of wisdom or resources or, or, or friends or connections than we did when we were younger. And so we're not so maybe desperate in our prayers. Um, and, and so we can find ourselves in this situation. And, and the Lord reminds Asa, when have I ever let you down? You know, wasn't I able to help you? Is there a place you couldn't count on me? You know, have I failed you? And, and all of us would say, of course not, Lord, you ha we haven't. But, but we can find ourselves doing things like this and not even seeking the Lord because, well, we kind of got it figured out. And the Lord says, that's just never a direction I, I, I want it to be. 
And just know, look at verse 9 again. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Or as I put it in the New Living Translation on the screen, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Let me just, the reason, you know, if, if you like to underline or highlight, I think this is like a, a key concept, you know, and one of the important reasons why I feel like going through the Old Testament is so important, uh, not just the New Testament, the, the Old Testament, because the heart of God is the same, but basically the Lord is saying, I am constantly looking in this world, my eyes are going everywhere, you know, to or fro, or they're searching the whole earth. I am looking for an opportunity to pour my resources, my gifts into a person's life who wants to receive them. I am constantly looking for that person. I am looking, I am looking, I am always looking. And if a person's heart, you know, is open and is looking towards and is desirous to be in the center of God's plan and God's will and to be used or realizes that, you know, this is me uh, and my resources and ability is, you know, a thimbleful. And then I have the Pacific Ocean in comparison to the Lord's resources, which is obviously is infinite, but you get the idea, right? You know, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Lord, I'm looking to you. I, I, I trust in you. The situations come up. And yeah, maybe, you know, you could take care of it by doing this or that or make a f- couple phone calls or take some money out of the bank or or, you know, changing this or that and kind of get out of this thing. Or I can just, Lord, I, I'm looking to you. I, I trust in you. And the Lord says, listen, I, I'm, I'm just looking for the person at, at, to pour myself, my spirit, my presence into their lives. I, I'm constantly looking. So the question is, is not his desire to do it. The real question in life is our desire to seek it and receive it. And, and, and this prophet is telling Asa, listen, he's, he's, he, was, he was looking to bless you. He wanted to hand the king of Syria, you notice in verse 7, over to you. I mean, he wasn't even fighting the king of Syria. The, the problem was with the king of Israel. So it was so much beyond what he wanted to do in the king's life and the people's life in the nation, you, you know, but they just chose not to. He just chose not to even move the Lord into a place or an opportunity where he could pour his spirit and his resources as he had in the past. And it's something we all need to be careful of. We constantly need to be careful of that because we can have that kind of heart of Asa. And he'd been walking with the Lord now for, you know, what we know, 36, you know, plus years, which was probably more because that's when he came to the throne and it wasn't at birth. So it was a long time. Just don't forget the eyes of the Lord are looking to bless, looking to pour out, looking for those whose hearts are in tune with him to do great things through. We just have to be open, available, and desirous to be there. Well, verse 10 tells us a little something about Asa's heart at this point. Do you remember how happy he was when God sent the prophet after they meet that million man army plus all the other, you know, war machines there? He was like, wow, that's great. Let's get everybody back to the temple and we'll all dedicate our hearts to the Lord. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard from the prophet. Okay. Well, this is not such good news and, and the Lord's still speaking to him, but this is his reaction in verse 10. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. So rather than having a tender heart when the Lord calls him on it and said, Asa, what were you doing? When have I let you down? What's going on with this? Why are you you heading this direction? man? You know, like David, when Nathan called him on the carpet for his sin, you know, the first thing he did is go in the temple and, okay, forgive me, Lord, and you could read about all that. We talked about that. His reaction is pride and embarrassment. And he didn't want to hear it. Like, what are you talking about? It worked great, right? I mean, that's how I imagine it going down, right? Who are you to criticize me? 
And, um, you know, it says that he was just so mad. Who are you? And he locked him up. And then obviously some people stuck up for the prophet, like, hey, say, you should listen to him. This is right. And then, you know, he got mad at those people, it says at the end of verse 10. But again, I, I think it's important. And, I, you know, I find myself doing this and have done this. And I imagine you have too. But, you know, how do we react when somebody calls us on something? When the Lord speaks to us, you know, through another person or directly to us in some way or through a message or through his word, you know, do we blast them? Do we put them down? Do we justify our actions? Well, look at it worked out. Okay. You know, it could have been bad and it worked, you know, I, I, what do we do? Imagine how it would have ended differently if he just had this heart of repentance. Oh man, why did I, even, I don't know what I was thinking or that was foolish. You're right, Lord. Um, you know, instead of just digging their heels in and their pride and, and, and their embarrassment uh, of that. And he did that. And, and, and God says, listen, I was looking to bless you. I really wanted to do it. But your heart, you didn't even, I wasn't even on the menu. <laughs> you didn't go to prayer. You didn't, do, you, didn't, you didn't do any of that. You just took the money and came up with this plan and, and, and went away at it. And... And imagine what the Lord would have done if he had just gone to him or just at least repented and, and, and said, yes, Lord, you're right. F forgive me. But he didn't. And again, think of the people that are reading this for the first time. They're coming back from the Babylonian captivity. They're reading about the acts of these kings, their forefathers, many generations. Okay, what happens when the Lord calls me on something like this? When we're, okay, you know, this is what not to do. This is what we should do. This is what the Lord's heart is. Up there on the screen, I'm looking to bless you. Man, I want to be that guy. <laughs> I don't want to be the other guy. Well, let's finish the rest of this chapter. And verse 11 says, note that the acts of Asa, first and last, are indeed written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And in the 39th year of his reign, so about three years after this happened, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was so severe. That means, I don't know what it was. He got a big infection, uh, gout. Uh, he had diabetes, maybe. You know, that does messes up your circulation, your feet. I don't know what happened. Maybe he got some wound and it got super infected, gangrene. It doesn't say. It was very severe. Yet, it says, in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. And so Asa rested with his father and he died in the 41st year of his reign. Now, again, um, you know, verse 12 comes to mind again. He you know, he didn't trust in the Lord. The Lord called him at it and kind of rather than respond with a tender heart, he responded in pride and anger. And then when this physical ailment hit him in the 39th year, it's not seeking the physicians that was the bad thing. Don't misunderstand that. Uh, the, the doctors weren't wrong. It's who was Asa trusting in? Who did he turn to? Again, he didn't turn to the Lord. He didn't ask the Lord. He didn't pray to the Lord. Lord, man, I got this disease. It's killing me. It's awful. I don't know what to do. Lord, please, you know, he just, give me the doctors. <laughs> give me the best specialists, you know. Get, I don't care where you got to go. You get me the best doctors. And, and the, the commentary is, is who are we trusting in? It's not that using the doctors were wrong. It's that Asa was putting his trust in. Not in the Lord, but in the medical profession. And let me just tell you, those guys work on, my, my dad says this, and this is a guy that's 90 plus years old. <laughs> and he tells me this constantly. It is kind of funny. He says, medicine is an art, not a science. Because <laughs> he's been to so many doctors and it realizes this, it, they, you know, it's just they kind of guess and they kind of hope and they kind of think there's no hard basis, even though there's some science to it. But he says it with a little grain of salt is that I could have something wrong with me and they, they just try to guess. Right. And, and the, the point is that, you know, uh, who are we trusting in? Uh, a question that we need to ask ourselves. Are we trusting in our own ability? Are we trusting in the ability of somebody else? 
as good and, and important and well-educated or well-experienced or whatever, uh, what are we trusting in? Who do we put our hope in? Who do we seek first when the issues and problems? Is it our Heavenly Father who's looking to do great things in our life? Or are we trying to figure it out and work it out and do it on our own and put it all together and just do it this way? And it's a question that needs to be asked uh, today in our own hearts and our own lives. Asa, you know, and on his, he just got stuck, you know. He just got stuck and, and then his heart grew a little harder and he grew a little harder and, and, and then, you know, pretty soon he's not even asking the Lord for anything. You know, I, 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 I just, just kind of does what everybody else does, right? People that don't know the Lord, they just try to figure it all out the best they can. And yet we have this infinite, and the word resource is, is probably a very wrong term, but it's the one that comes to my mind. Infinite holy God, I guess probably more accurately, that loves us and is looking to do great work in the lives of of his children, of his people, and 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 yet how many times do we, after we try and knock our head against the wall or struggling in this area and this problem in our life or our this sin maybe or we're, you know or or you know this situation comes up and then you know we bang our heads against the wall for a good hour, week, year, whatever it is. And then finally, you know, this desperate point, oh, I guess I should pray, you know, and we can find ourselves doing that. And, um, and, and, and we got to remember the Lord's just looking to who and looking to pour out and to bless and to use and to show himself strong, right? Because listen, Asa's was battle, was, uh, his strategy was very successful. But who gets the glory in the end of that? Asa, right? And Ben Haydad gets some some glory there, right? I mean, yeah, look at that. Oh yeah, we got the buddy up here. He took care of it. And yeah, we got all this. We used the gold, and then we had all this stuff. Oh, it worked out really great. And at the end of the day, you know, where's the Lord on the sidelines? What do the people need to hear? What do we need to hear? What do we need to share? What kind of testimony do we need to be just like Asa to ben, the Ben-Hadads of this world or the Baasha kings of Israel? They're both ungodly. It's to show that it's not about me and my ability or what I can do, but it's about our Heavenly Father and His love and His planet and who He is. And let me show you uh, some of His power and glorious work through my life or through this situation in my life or through this situation, you know, it, it, through the nation in this case. And then it's like, wow, well, yeah, that dude couldn't have pulled that off on his own. Right. Who gets the credit? Who gets the glory? Our Heavenly Father, where it belongs. Because if people start depending and looking, at, wow, you know, Asa, you're such a smart guy. You got it all figured out. Oh, yeah, you're pretty good. And then you start becoming like these crazy, well, Maybe I'll strike the word crazy, but you come like these people that are, you know, famous that start believing their own press and they start thinking they are something really special because people write them fan letters and there's 8 million followers they have. And man, if they type something on TikTok or Twitter or Facebook or post something on Snap or whatever and Instagram and they get, you know, 10,000 responses and blah, 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 you know, and then, you know, they start believing their own press that they are something better smarter or something than everybody else and then the ego and then you know the lord what's he well nothing really and then people as we do that as believers as christians and they start saying wow that pastor that christian guy that christian oh he's so good and they start looking to you and they wow what a godly man what a godly woman what a godly person what a godly you know this and uh you know situation and they're so smart and they got to figure out, and they start looking to you like you're something better than everybody else and I can guarantee you that you and I will let them down every time. We'll fail. We'll drop the ball here. We'll do something we shouldn't do. We'll not do something we should do. And, and then people, oh man, you know, my whole opinion of God now is based on how I good I'm doing or how bad I'm, you know. But when we point them to Jesus, when we point them to the Lord and say, listen, you, you put your trust in him. Look at him. He's the one that did it. He's never going to let them down. And that's why we give him the glory. It's not that 
God needs to be puffed up or has some ego that needs to be fanned or something like that is that when people put their trust in him and we point to him instead of, uh, we'll let him down. He never will. He will, he will do everything perfectly and exactly right. And so we point to him so that others might look to him and not to us. And, and in this case, you know, Asa gets all the, the glory, but how quickly he can drop the ball, right? And what happens to the Lord that's supposed to get the glory and draw these heathen? Wow, look, at how did he do this? By praying to this God he worships? What kind of God is that? I pray to my God and I get nothing or I don't pray at all. And, you know, and maybe I should be. Oh, tell me more about this. And so, uh, you know, as we demonstrate that in our lives and who do we trust in? Who do we turn to? How do we act? Where, where do we go? Then, you know, it just does nothing. But the Lord uses that, does great things. So his name is lifted up on high and then we get to point Wow, that was great. No, you know, it wasn't me. If it was up to me, it had all been messed up. It was up to the Lord, and He did great things through me. And we give Him the glory, and people are drawn to Him, and He won't let them down, unlike us. And so we need to ask ourselves that. Who are we trusting in? Well, Asa passes off the scene here, verse 14, and they buried him in his own tomb, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and they laid him in the bed, which was filled with spices and various ingredients prepared by a mixture of ointments, and they made a very great burning for him. Now, they buried the kings. They don't do the Hindu thing of burning the bodies, but the idea is he'd been a king for a long time, and there was a lot of good in Asa, and I, the Lord's, you know, willing to, to share his failings, uh, I certainly believe we'll see him in heaven. Um, I, I, you know, I, I personally believe that. But, you know, but the people here, what they're doing is that we'll really miss him. And he was a good king. And yes, the dirty laundry is aired out. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, you know, they were just going to say, hey, we miss this king who was who was good to us and who the Lord used. And though certainly the Lord's pointing out his failures here we still will miss him. And so they have like a, you know, a, cell, uh, a memorial service, we would say today. But obviously it was the king, so it was something a lot bigger. Well, I was wanting to get into chapter 17, and I seem to go at a very slow pace. So we'll call it a night there. We'll pick it up with his son Jehoshaphat next time in chapter 17. And we'll spend about four chapters on Jehoshaphat because... He's another very uh, interesting character that the Lord will hold up on display for us. So let's pray. Father, again, we do thank you for these lessons. And first of all, we do thank you that, that this is your heart, that you're, you're looking, your eyes are constantly on this world, and your desire is to do great things through people in this world, those that are looking to you whose heart is just wants to be in tune with your will and your plan and your way that you might do great things in and through them. And, um, you know, Lord, I, I don't know if this world has uh, ever seen a person whose heart is you know, completely sold out, um, uh, but we've seen a lot of great people and uh, over the years, Lord, not just biblical fi uh, uh, figures, but also... Um, certainly uh, historical church history figures that you used in great way. And I think of guys like Moody that were a shoe salesman and just, and, you know, you, he just had a heart to be used by you. And of course, um, you know, Wesley, and I just, the names go on and on. Um, uh, man, um, like his name went in and out of my health, the head, the guy that rode on the horse everywhere and remember his name, Lord, but how you just, you know, had an open heart to be used by you, and, um, uh, you, you know, and that's just, you know, here, and think about the world and over church history. You're still looking for people to do great things in and through, and we just want to have the heart that just is open and desirous to be at the center of uh, your will and your plan uh, for 
that person in that situation and that city or that state or that country or you know I, I don't know how big it can go but it can go huge and Lord it's just a matter of desiring and lining our hearts up because you you're ready to do it and you say you are and Lord help us just to learn the lesson of Asa where we just don't rely on our own abilities and time goes by and we got a little wiser and have a little bit more money and have a better connections or you know think we have better ideas we can figure it out and we'll come to you Lord if we need you help us not to have that heart it's 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 easy to step into that and then if I get desperate well then I'll, I'll check in with you but father help us to be those that come to you first and always are desperate for you and Lord um, we, we know that's the best place to be it's not the most comfortable place to be if as a matter of fact it's sometimes very uncomfortable but it's the best place for us to be, Lord. Because when we just depend on you for everything and look to you and trust in you, and you've never let us down, and we all know that, and help us to remember that and continue to hold your name up high in this world, Lord, as many days as you give us.